Welcome to Cross Border Tax Talks, where we discuss the latest trends in international taxation, from U.S. tax reform to the European Union's latest developments. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's U.S. International Tax Services leader. You can find me on Twitter at XBorderTax. On this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks, I'm excited to be joined by Pam Olson. Pam is PwC's U.S. Deputy Tax Leader and Washington National Tax Services Practice Leader. Before joining PwC, Pam was Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Pam, welcome back to the podcast. Good to be here again, Doug. So the last time you were on, we had a very enlightening discussion, particularly for me, somebody new to the Beltway, about Treasury. And I've had a number of podcasts where we've talked. We had Kevin Livingston on where we actually talked about the Joint Committee of Taxation. And so been spending some time on the podcast really learning about the ins and outs of how legislation becomes law, how regulations work. We had Mike DeFranzo on talking about his experiences at the IRS and how he teamed with your team and Treasury. And so one of the things that has come up a lot as we think about U.S. tax reform and specifically the Tax Cuts and Job Act or the TCJA, which we have to remind listeners isn't actually the official name of the legislation, but what us practitioners commonly it's refer to it. it. It's what we all call it, the TCJA. As new reg packages have come out, we've talked about 245 Cap A, we've talked about the guilty rules, we've talked about all kinds of both proposed, final, and temporary regs. Well, one of the things that is a common theme about the TCJA, and I think a lot of this is a consequence of just how quickly the legislation was drafted and then enacted, was there are some things that are probably incorrect, not even probably. I think even in the JCT Blue Book, we saw the the JCT actually specifically mention in a number of different footnotes like, hey, this really wasn't intended. This needs to be corrected. Yes. And so what I'm interested in learning about, and I get a lot of questions from clients as I travel around the country, like, hey, when is this provision going to be fixed? Like, they couldn't have really meant that. And then we've also see, I think, Treasury trying to do everything they can within their power, I think sometimes arguably maybe exceeding that. But you're in obviously in a very difficult position to try to maybe through regulation fix some of the things that maybe were, were not quite as clear as they could have been in, uh, in the statutes. But maybe just talk a little bit about what is, let's start with what is a technical correction? How does it differ from other tax legislation? And really understand like, do we, is this a separate provision like in the tax code? And and how does that differ from a, you know, legislative perspective? Okay, so to start with, um, Congress, believe it or not, does not always pass perfect laws. Right. There are oftentimes mistakes. And lots of times those mistakes get corrected relatively quickly. Uh, For example, if we think back to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in March of 20, let's see, it was passed in 2017, so March of 2018, I think it was, we had a couple of technical corrections made. Actually, maybe they shouldn't be called technical corrections because what they were dealing with was unanticipated consequences of the legislation. But one of the things that went along with correcting those unanticipated consequences of the 2017 legislation were some technical corrections that went back to much earlier legislation, like legislation that was pre-2016, so 2015, 2014. The life insurance industry may have set a record a couple of years ago in identifying a technical correction needed from legislation passed in 1959. Oh, interesting. Yes, it's a miscross-reference. But so the laws um, very often, in fact, probably in most cases, are passed with some kind of an error. Sure. Sometimes um, they are quite significant. You know, if we look back at the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017, there was a provision dealing with qualified improvement property, which is really important to people in particular in the retail or food services industry. Um, They got dropped out of a provision allowing expensing. And so they've been trying to get that fixed um, since 2017. Um, It was clearly intended, it was counted in the score that the Joint Committee on Taxation put together of the cost of the legislation, but for whatever reason that cross-reference to that section got dropped out and so they were outside of that provision. There have even been letters from members of Congress to Treasury saying, would you please administer the law as though we had correctly drafted it. But so mistakes get made. Mm 
when mistakes get made on legislation that's been enacted, then what Congress has to do is to come back and enact more legislation to fix the errors. When it's clear that Congress intended something and there's an error in the statute, then we refer to that as a technical correction. There's got to be something that clearly indicated what Congress intended. You know, maybe it's uh, it was clearly counted in the score. Okay. Maybe it's described in the committee report. Um, so there's going to be something that says, hey, this is what Congress intended to do, but oops, they, they goofed when the legislation got finally put together and it didn't get done, and so then we've got to go back and fix it. In that situation, what the Joint Committee on Taxation says is there is zero revenue attached to that, even though it's clearly a substantive change. I mean, like if we look at what the law says today about qualified improvement property versus what Congress intended it to say, there's clearly going to be a change in the law if and when Congress gets around to enacting that mm-hmm. technical correction. Um, but the Joint Committee on Taxation would still say zero revenue score attached to it because we took it into account when we passed the legislation back in 2017. So um, the, the Joint Committee on Taxation um, wouldn't necessarily say, well, look at whether or not there's a revenue effect in uh, what's being corrected to decide whether something's a technical correction or whether it's new starter legislation. But that is one of the things that we would look at in trying to figure out whether or not the Joint Committee on Taxation thinks it's a technical correction or not. When it comes time to actually move technical correction legislation, mm-hmm. it is not um, it can't be run through the budget reconciliation process. And, so. and remind us what the budget reconciliation okay. process is. So the budget reconciliation process is what we used to move the 2017 tax, or Congress used to move the uh, 2017 tax legislation. What it does is it allows legislation that fits within certain parameters to go through the Senate without being subject to the filibuster rules. So you don't have to get to 60 votes in the Senate in order to move the legislation. You can do it with a bare majority of you know, 50 plus the vice president right. or 51, 51 votes to move something ahead. So um, other legislation, other tax legislation that's not covered by the budget reconciliation process goes through the Senate in regular order, meaning it's subject to filibuster, meaning you got to get 60 votes to cut off debate to allow the legislation to move forward. And that's a challenge because, y- you know, it used to be that if you were going to, you were a senator and you were going to filibuster or something, you had to actually go to the floor and you had to hold the floor. Now the rules allow senators to basically say, I will filibuster. And that means the majority leader will set the legislation aside, not bring it to the floor until he knows that he can actually get the 60 votes to cover the filibuster, and he's got the time in sure. to put into it. So we can move. Um, we can't. We can't move technical corrections legislation without going through regular order. And what that's going to mean, because Congress doesn't get real excited about going back to fix the mistakes that they made. Yes. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's not something that they tend to want to grab on and say, "Oh, yes, tomorrow we're going to go get mm-hmm. this done." So what tends to happen is that the technical corrections legislation gets drafted and then it gets attached to something else that Congress is moving on. And uh, that's how we get technical corrections legislation. So, so just some enacted. other piece of legislation, not necessarily tax. It, I mean, it, It'll be a revenue measure of some sort. Okay. Um, but yeah, it'll get attached to some revenue measure. Like some of the things that we have coming up right now, we've got, we've got um, the expiring provisions. We've got provisions that expired a couple of years ago that still haven't been extended by Congress, but that Congress still says they want to go back and extend. One so, of those that many of our listeners are very interested in, as you well know, is our 954 C6 look through. Yes, the CFC look through. The rules. CFC to CFC interest, dividends, rents, royalties. So many of our listeners on the Cross Border Tax Talks podcast are anxiously wondering is, is, that, is that going to get, get extended? extended again? Right. Yeah. And so the good news, you want to stop for a second and talk about extenders. The good news about the fact that we have these ex- expiring provisions, expired, not expiring, but expired provisions. Right. right. Um, and we're now late in the year for considering any of those. So we had some that expired at the end of 2017, some that expired at the end of 2018. And so now we're getting closer to the end of 2019, which increases the likelihood of when Congress goes back, assuming it does go back, to renew those provisions that have already expired, Mm -hmm. that they will include the provisions 
that will be expiring at the end of this year as well. So that's probably good news for our listeners who are interested in seeing CFC look through okay. extended. And and the possi- there's a possibility coming back to the technical corrections that they may attach some or all or a portion, I guess maybe some of the less controversial ones. Yeah, so um, it pr- probably has less to do with uh, contra- controversy than whether it has some political momentum behind it. So the qualified improvement property is a good example. There are a couple of provisions that have attracted enough sympathy on the part of members of Congress of both sides that they might be willing to move those. But there's also some reluctance on the part of the Democrats to even engage in a conversation about technical corrections. They continue to say, we weren't in the room when the legislation was drafted. If there are mistakes, they're not our fault. It's your problem. By the way, Republicans, you haven't come to talk to us about them. And so until we know what they are and we understand them, we're not anxious to move them. Um, at, at some point, they may, uh, the wounds may heal from the fact that they weren't included in the process in 2017 such that they're willing to consider the technical corrections but you know if you think back to the the big piece of legislation that moved during the obama administration that was what the affordable care act right Right. well guess what republicans did when they took over the house i vaguely remember yes so we have never had the uh, the affordable care act like the tcja was not perfect there were a number of things that right. needed technical corrections, and those technical corrections have never been enacted. Now, that statute passed in 2010, so we're nine years on from that. Those technical corrections have never been done. It could be a very long time before the technical corrections from TCJA uh, get considered. So I- is there a mechanism other than through actual legislative change to potentially try to enforce or, or – you know, say that, well, listen, this was obviously like a Scrivener's error. So you had mentioned the qualified improvements there. There's one in the foreign tax credit space where in the base deference, there's a a cross reference and it's been written about publicly where it's a cross reference to, to the, the wrong basket, for example, to the branch basket. And everybody knows that's not really what they intended. They just failed to, to make an appropriate reference, for example. But are, are there any other opportunities other than given the polarization that we have and the kind of tit for tat between the Affordable Care Act and as you'd mentioned the TCJA. I, I just would be surprised if everybody's gonna, you know, hold hands sing Kumbaya and we're gonna see sixty votes in the Senate. What 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 else is available if yes, anything? Yes, it would be nice if we could have some Kumbaya and some things get done on a bipartisan basis. But so, you know, um, without legislation, there have been times in the past when an error was made in enacting a statute and the what I will refer to as the four horsemen. The chairman of the Ways and Means, ranking member of Ways and Means, chairman of Senate Finance, ranking member of Senate Finance. So the the four top people from both parties of the two tax writing committees will get together and they will write a letter to the Secretary of the Treasury. And they will say, dear Mr. Secretary, this is what we intended to do. We've made an error. We ask you to administer the law as though we had included the provision as intended as opposed to as actually written and we commit to you that we will move technical corrections legislation to address this issue as soon as possible in that situation the secretary of the treasury would then be in a position to consider with congressional backing whether or not they wanted to entertain administering the law as congress intended it as opposed to how it was actually written sure but you know it's 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 going to depend on how the general counsel of the treasury interprets statute and the treasury secretary's authority to do it and that will get factored in when i was at the treasury department we had a couple of those instances where legislation was enacted that wasn't perfect and we were asked to administer it in accordance with what congress intended and we did give that favorable consideration Um, but in that case we were quite confident that the technical corrections legislation would be advanced pretty quickly fixing the issue otherwise and was it, it in hindsight was it yes, fixed? it was okay. it was otherwise it's up to treasury and irs to look at the statute that they've been given and to decide whether or not they have sufficient administrative authority whether it's granted in the statute itself as it was enacted or if it's 7805b or something you know 7805 something like that that right. gives treasury and irs general discretion to administer and interpret the laws and they would then decide whether or not and as uh, you've probably noticed 
noted on some other podcasts, there have been situations where there's been something that's been left out that was taxpayer favorable mm -hmm. um, being left out uh, or, or that it was favorable to taxpayers that it was left out. And Treasury has tried to close those gaps by um, um, issuing regulations to, to plug the gaps and do what they think Congress intended as opposed to what Congress actually wrote in the statute. So if the Four Horsemen write that letter, I assume that's that's a public record, right? So we would we would know if and when that's happened. And then, for example, when you were at Treasury and received that letter and then made that, that and the secretary made the judgment to be able to say they were going to force that, how is that communicated to, is it through a note? Or what, what, is there a process that Treasury then informs taxpayers that, hey, we're going to, we know that this is what it says, but this is how we're going to enforce the rules? Uh, yes, so it, it is very public. So when the four horsemen write to Treasury, they will generally release the letter. But even if they didn't, the secretary is a standing FOIA order. So okay. that correspondence that goes back and forth between the Hill and um, Treasury tends to, to hit the press fairly quickly. Okay. And that's Freedom of Information Act, which yes. requires these kind of public com these, the communications yes, between standing, public officials. standing court order that requires Treasury. It's a, it's not public officials. It's 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 um, correspondence to and from Treasury Got that's it. subject to a standing court order to be um, disclosed to the public. So the information gets out there fairly quickly. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that if um, it has risen to the level of the four horsemen being willing to get together to write a letter to the secretary, it's high profile. It's something people care about. And so it's something that's going to be communicated fairly quickly. And have we seen that with the TCJA? Has that process been through for like this fix to improve? Have we seen no, that? No, it's it's been there. There's been bipartisan interest in making the fix and bipartisan letters that have been written to Treasury, but it's not come from the Four Horsemen. Okay. So we haven't got the chairman and ranking members of both of the tax writing committees to engage on it. So where because we're in such a stalemate, a political stalemate in in Congress. Maybe kind of asking you to put your hat back on back when you were at Treasury and as I think about the officials currently sitting over there and all of the reg packages that, that have come out. Talk a little bit about the process that the team at Treasury is probably going through, and I appreciate that it's speculative, but you know, there's been a lot of commentary and even discussion on this podcast that Treasury's exceeded its authority and you know, really trying to, and obviously it's a gray line, but Talk about you know, what is the process at Treasury? What do you think they're going through to try to figure out, okay, hey, we need to administer the law. There's all these complicated provisions. We need regulations. Some of these provisions were, you know, need to be technically corrected. They probably won't. And so, you know, can they fix them regulatorily? Mm -hmm. And talk a little bit about, you know, that process and making the decision between 7805 and like how does Treasury kind of contemplate fixing things themselves, if you will? So, you know, one of the things that, that we didn't talk about was the difference between a technical correction where it's something that Congress clearly intended to do and they goofed, they put in the wrong cross-reference okay. or they left something out or whatever, and something that we would look at after the fact and say, Congress, you didn't really intend that, <laughs> did you, right? Okay. Um, and, and that's more in the order like the, the uh, co-op provision that got corrected back in 2018. It was a, going to be a market-moving event, um, and so Congress said, "Yeah, okay, that we didn't intend that to happen. Okay. We got to come in and we got to." That one that. had bipartisan support. That right? one had bipartisan it was like, support. Uh oh, yeah, okay. that was an uh oh. That's that's that was a let's get that fixed. Um, but so um, it, it depends on on whether it's like if it's something that's a clear technical correction, but. Treasury thinks that there's something else in the statute, like maybe they've been given a broad grant of regulatory authority in the statute to administer the law. Now, sometimes the grants of regulatory authority are written in kind of an anti-abuse fashion. Right. So they will say, you know, Treasury can write whatever rules are needful to prevent the circumvention or, what, you know, some right. language like that. Yep. Um, other times it's a more general grant of regulatory authority. In any event, you know, if there's a specific grant of regulatory authority in the statute, um, w at least when I was at Treasury, mm -hmm. I felt like that gave me a little bit more license to um, make the right calls. The right calls meaning making calls that make logical sense, that will produce r results for taxpayers that mm -hmm. are logical. So um, that I would feel that way. Then, you know, if there if that isn't there, you know, then you look to the other authorities that um, Treasury and IRS have. 
to administer the law and decide whether or not administering the law in a particular way is really the, the right answer, does, does a better job of carrying out the intent of Congress than reading it a different way. Mm-hmm. But you've got to, you know, you've got to find something in the words of the statute, one fashion or another, to feel comfortable moving in that direction of, it, of writing a regulation that some might look at and say, that's not covered by the statute or that's not what Congress wrote or, you know, what, whatever. Um, but so that, that's kind of the process that you'll go through. And my assumption is that's the process that they're going through as well. Now, there has been some concern over the course of the last um, 10 years or so. It was, was really began, I think, in the Obama administration that um, Treasury, well, agencies in general, but Treasury as one of the agencies mm-hmm. of the uh, executive branch um, had strayed beyond the statutory authority that Congress had given them, and so the, um, the 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 general counsel of the Treasury, who's been nominated to be an undersecretary now, has been described as uh, somebody who was a literalist, so somebody who believed in strict construction of the statute, mm-hmm. meaning okay, I don't really care if there's a grant of authority I might find somewhere else or I might think that when it comes to administering the law, I should be able to do what's right as opposed to what's written in the statutes. Um, that, so there was a greater reluctance um, with the current administration to go in that direction than perhaps was the case with the Obama administration. Um, so th- there's been some dialing back, um, at least relative to when I was at Treasury, I think. Okay. Um, 15 years ago with, with what um, the folks at Treasury might be willing to do on the administrative side. I see. So a- as we're looking back, can you talk, I mean, what are some other examples, I mean, in, in history? And I think it's, it's, it's hard, right, to look back given just the polarization that we have now, you know, politically and in Congress. But, you know, even maybe even looking back to, to the, the 87 Act and the I mean, Act. Or the 86 Act and, and, and I think it was 2001 you had mentioned. Talk mm-hmm. a little bit about mm-hmm. the, the um, some of the, you know, h- how has this worked in the past, if that can inform maybe what, what might happen in the future? Yeah. So um, the uh, technical corrections in the tax world are almost always eventually considered, um, but it doesn't happen as quickly as we might like it to happen. So I think in uh, when the 86 Act passed, um, it had a, a, a fairly significant number of Scrivener's errors, missed cross-references, mm-hmm. uh, 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 things that, that people hadn't thought through um, clearly. Um, and I, th- I think that the technical corrections for the 86 Act didn't get enacted until 88. Okay. So that passed in October of 86, sometime in, I think, maybe spring or thereabouts of uh, 80, 88, we got the technical corrections, the 86 Act. I, and that I was, was that had bipartisan so that remind had bipartisan. us remind us what the political yeah, environment yes, was the, back then. The, the uh, 86 Act was passed with a great deal of bipartisan support. Now, the bipartisan support was very strong on in the Senate. It was less so in the House back then. Okay. Um, but it was passed with bipartisan support and when it came time to do the technical corrections, those likewise moved forward. I mean again, you're you're looking for Congress having the time to devote to it and being willing to put things on the floor and that kind of stuff. But they did move um, technical corrections, I I think, within about a year and a half of the statute being enacted. Um, We're obviously past a year and a half at at this point from the 2017 legislation. It's hard to believe, but that's right. That's right. And um, and some would say, and we're still finding errors with it. We will continue to find errors with it. I mean, one of the things that I think is sort of comical is like people's complaints about um, the 86 Act uh, or the 2017 Act relative to the 86 Act and how much longer we spent putting together the 86 Act. Well, I'm not sure that that's exactly right. And certainly one of the biggest problems with the 86 Act was that we, um, our, our, our system of taxation on the international side with a 35% rate and right. you know lockout effect and all that kind of stuff. Well, that wasn't a problem immediately, but it became a problem over t- a fairly short period of time as other countries started dropping their rates and started adopting territorial as opposed to worldwide systems. I mean, it took us you know, 30 years to correct that 
error right in terms of the impact that it had on the u.s economy very um unfortunate but so you and know, you're just to unpack that to make sure the listeners understand because i think it's a really good point your your point is is that with the deferral system that we had in the past with the 35 percent rate and then all the other you know most of the other major jurisdictions reducing the rate below 35 companies were disincentivized to actually bring the cash back to the right. u.s and that's right. the lockout effect that yeah. you mentioned that's right and it so yeah a so, real incentive to invest your profit somewhere other than the united states which obviously is not consistent with the policy that was in, was intended right and so that's of, the point of, of the investing 30 years, in america yes. investing 30, in 30 years it 30 took years. us 30 years to fix that um no it wasn't a problem for a few years but i mean it became a problem it was a fairly obvious problem. It still took a long time for Congress to focus on it. But, you know, there were other other things in the 86 Act, like, for example, um, the passive activity loss rules that were intended to address what was seen as probably the biggest issue in the tax system mm-hmm. at that point in time. Um, they were They were developed by six people behind closed doors on a weekend. Um, and, you know, some people would contend that they caused the real estate crash at the end of the 80s, and then the SNL crisis, et cetera, et cetera, in this country. So, In fact, Richard McGinnis made that exact point on one of the earlier podcasts. Oh, is that right? He, he did. Okay. That was an education for me, too. Okay. I, I was before I was practicing, but Richard, actually, who's one of our retired partners, for those who are not familiar with Richard, I'd highly encourage that. It's an entertaining podcast. He was talking about what it was like practicing international tax in the 80s, uh-huh. and that was one of the points that he had mentioned with the, with the 86 Act. Yes. So, you know... It, I, I actually think that um, a lot of thought and consideration went into the 2017 Act, and I know that there are lots of things about it that people didn't like. On the other hand, there are revenue considerations, and sure. you know, Congress has to raise a certain amount of revenue. We may not like the fact that they do or the ways in which they do it, but you know, so Congress can't anticipate. Um, it does a lot of things quickly and behind closed doors, um, and. Um, we're going to continue to see how these things play out over time. And, you know, particularly all the changes are made on the international side, given that we're not the lone actors when it comes to taxation on the international side. Rather, we're sharing jurisdiction to tax with countries around the globe. We're going to see other countries make movements, and it is certainly to be hoped that we will move more quickly to address any problems that are caused by our tax laws than was the case with respect to the 86 Act until 2017. Right, and a great example of that is already, and we'll have a, 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 a another podcast on this issue, but what, where I think many of us are referring to is BEPS 2.0. Right. Right, and then there's Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, which we'll break down in, another, in a future podcast. But Pillar 2 is really the OECD's suggestion that, hey, maybe we should consider minimum taxes. Like, That's look, right. The US, look, the U.S. did guilty. Why don't we do that, too? Why don't we have a minimum tax? And I would presume that that will mean a by country as opposed to the U.S. system. Obviously, we look at guilty on an aggregation on a global, on a yeah. global, on a global basis. Yes. It's going to be very interesting because, you know, if you think back to BEPS, one, one uh, which hasn't even fully enacted that, yet. That's right. It hasn't been fully enacted. But one of the, one of the action items in that you know, 15 item bucket was um, minimum taxes. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it attracted zero interest. The only country that was interested in it was the United States. The folks at the OECD said, yeah, you know, we thought we might see some pickup on the part of developing countries that that might have an interest in it. But no, none, zip zero. The U.S. was the only one. So it's in the report coming out of uh, BEPS 1.0 or the the 15 item action plan from 2015. But nobody did anything with it. Um, You know, I think those of us who had watched Dave Camp put out his draft when he was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, put out his draft international legislation in 2011, which then became an actual introduced bill in 2014, anticipated that a minimum tax of some sort might be in our future, but did not expect it to perhaps sweep the globe so quickly. Right. So... um, I, we, we couldn't have you on without a little bit of prognostication about what might happen in the future with, with these technical corrections. And so, you know, by the time any of the people listen to this, we'll hopefully have final beat regs or at least new beat regs. I mean, we're waiting on FTC, all kinds of regulation packages we're, we're still waiting for. Those will come out um, because many of those did not meet the, the June deadline. I think many of those are not going to be retroactive. 
back to the, the date of enactment, which will create its own kind of chaos. And so I think most many taxpayers then will have to be forced to look at the statute. And then some of these statutes need to be technically corrected too. So it just you know adds more uncertainty to the mix. What's your speculation? Are we gonna see some technical corrections um, this year? Will it be part of extenders? And then maybe even a little political prognosticating as far as what might, what might happen in the future? So I would say, I don't think it's impossible that it, it will be attached to expiring provisions and the two of them enacted in 2019. But I'm doubtful. And the reason I'm doubtful is because the dialogue is, has not yet occurred between Republicans and Democrats about mm -hmm. what needs to be fixed coming out of 2017. So until that dialogue actually starts, and I think it, is, it has started a little bit among the staff okay. members, but still not in a really robust, formal kind of way, from at least from what I hear um, from the Democrats on the on the Hill. So there still has not been a really robust discussion. Without that, it's really hard to see how technical corrections can move ahead, um, because again, it's got to be bipartisan. Of course, now we have a House controlled by the Democrats, so clearly Democrats are going to have to sign on for this mm -hmm. to move forward. So I don't think I don't expect it to happen in okay. 2019. It's not impossible, but I don't expect it to happen. Um, at one point earlier this year, the um, uh, gentleman who's the, the chief tax counsel for the Ways and Means Committee, Andrew Grossman, ha who was on the Joint Committee on Taxation in 2017 when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed. So he's definitely familiar with the legislation. Okay. But he had suggested that the um, idea of technical corrections had become so toxic with Democrats that um, people should actually think about just going up to talk about changes that needs to be made to the Internal Revenue Code. Setting aside, yes, it's clearly in the category of technical correction. Okay. Don't call it that. Just got it. Just say it's it a marketing needs, yes, strategy. Yes, that's right. It needs to be fixed. You know, enact this legislation that takes care of this issue for us. Um, Not you're fixing the quote unquote Republicans' mistakes or right. like, hey, this is an issue. It needs to be addressed. Right. So if it doesn't happen in 2019, then, you know, sometime in 2020, yeah, it could happen sometime in 2020. Election side. Elections are, you know, so maybe it's a lame duck, you know, the, the session of Congress that occurs after the elections have occurred. So it's the guys coming back who may or may not have been real elected. Right. Maybe, it's, maybe it's in that session where they decide to move technical corrections. But again, there's going to have to be some dialogue between Republicans and Democrats, I think, before this moves. And so we've got to look for that to happen. And if the Democrats would would sweep, um, and presumably if the Republicans would sweep and take over, then that obviously makes things a lot easier for them to, to, for, to get the technical corrections through, assuming that they would win the House and the Senate, not suggesting that that's even a realistic possibility, but just theoretically. But again, we've still got that 60-vote issue Fair in enough. the Senate. So Fair enough. Uh, I don't think there's any outlook out there that would suggest that Republicans take 60 votes in the in the Senate, so okay. you know, if if, it, if it's if it go if it's uh, status quo, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's any in incentive one way or another to do things. I mean, maybe some of the Republicans who might be leaving at the end of 2020, regardless, would like to see things fixed from 2017, so they would push to get it done before they finally exit Washington. Um, but if there's a if there's a complete change. You know, again, maybe there's an incentive, but the Democrats at that point might be just saying, yeah, you know, forget it. Um, whatever. Repeal, repeal and replace? Yes, there you go. Right. What, what, whatever happens, we're not, we know we're going to get a better result in 2021 than we're going to get the end of 2020. So let's just hold on it. All right. So effectively what I'm hearing is we're just going to have to continue to live with the uncertainty. And it's not just the uncertainty in the U.S., it's uncertainty across the globe. And I think all of us in the tax profession are just having to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and living with this uncertainty and you know, tr just trying to, to take reasonable positions. And I mean, it's really challenging with a number of the deals and transactions that, that I advise on, that, that we work on. There's just a lot of uncertainty. And uh, you know, it's just, it's part of the, I mean, there's always been, been that you know, in my relatively short 20 year career, but it just seems to be even more so than, than ever before. Yes, indeed. And I think the global changes will make the United States look fairly certain by comparison.
Well, well, we'll leave it at that. And I think that's a hook for, for one of our next uh, podcasts where we spend a little bit more time focusing on BEPS 2.0 and some of those global changes. Sounds so, good. Pam, thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Cross Border Tax Talks. And thank you, Pam Olson, PwC's U.S. Deputy Tax Leader and Washington National Tax Services Practices Leader. I'm Doug McConey, PwC's International Tax Services Leader. Stay tuned in two weeks for another exciting edition of Cross Border Tax Talks. Thank you.